Hey, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm very excited to have this conversation with Jonathan Rausch. I have profound respect for Jonathan, and I've I've uh, his his last two books have in particular have influenced me, and I've gotten to know uh, Jonathan uh, over the past few months. It's been it's been delightful. Uh, first, before I introduce him, we're gonna watch a, a feature from Reason with Jonathan. And while we do that, feel free to answer any poll questions that Reed is pulling up. At the link is pinned to the live chat. So thanks. So Reed, let's let's play it and let's talk to Jonathan. I think canceling is and why it's different from criticism. Criticism is expressing an argument or opinion with the idea of rationally influencing public opinion through public persuasion, interpersonal persuasions. Canceling comes from the universe of propaganda, not critical discourse. And it's about organizing or manipulating a social environment or a media environment with a goal or predictable effect of isolating or deplatforming or intimidating an ideological opponent. It's about making an idea or a person socially radioactive. Today, you'll hear the activists say, well, I didn't read the thing. I don't need to read the thing to know that it's colonialist or racist. So an open society is a place that has a lot of intellectual pluralism, a lot of diversity of viewpoints. It tries to pit bias and prejudice against other biases and prejudice. And it does that by forcing contention and critical argument and forcing people to persuade each other over time. That's really what science is. That's really what journalism is. The open society is not only incomparably better at producing knowledge than any other society because it allows us to make errors and not be punished for making errors. It allows us to make errors, in fact, much more quickly. That's the secret of science. I call it liberal science. The magic of liberal science is in the institutions that force us to channel these conversations in socially productive ways. If you're an academic, you're writing for journals, you're undergoing peer review, you're being credentialed by some kind of scientific organization. If you're a journalist, you submit to ethics codes, you probably work for an organization where you're supposed to tell the truth. All of these things are mediated in ways which allow us to be individuals, but also to understand some rules of engagement to follow each other. Society where you don't have that or a community, like, say, Twitter, or like, say, an academic culture where it's student to student and peer to peer, where you don't have that kind of mediation going on, the social fabric turns into kind of Lord of the Flies. Who can gang up on who? Who can make the most noise? Who can attract the most followers? And you begin to display to each other instead of talking to each other. Weirdly, the way to help us be more liberated as individuals is to strengthen the institutions that we use to connect each other. This is not a fight between one set of people and another set of people. It is also a fight within ourselves. There are ideas that each of us hate, and that it's very hard to restrain ourselves from not ganging up on in an illiberal way. The idea that wrongheaded and dangerous and heretical and blasphemous ideas should be not only allowed but protected is preposterous. It's ridiculous. No society has ever had that idea until about 250 years ago. It shouldn't work. But here we are, and the reason is because, despite its ridiculousness, it has the one great advantage of being the single most successful social principle ever invented. Jonathan Rausch, that was incredibly profound. Thanks for talking to me today. Do you have any comments on that? Because I have so many questions about that. I've never even seen it before. I think it's great. Who is that oh, really? guy? <laughs> yeah. He's a guy I have to have a conversation with. <laughs> You'll have to send me the URL so I can show that to my friends and family. You're going to buy impressed. that guy's books. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, okay. Do, do you have any comments on that before I ask some questions? No, go right ahead. How do you, how do you get somebody to value a liberal society who doesn't value a liberal society? That's a question I've been thinking about for quite some time. Well, I can tell you how I do it. Okay. I write books. I write articles. I do podcasts. Um, I try to remind people again and again not to take these institutions and ideas for granted, which is really hard to do because we all take them for granted, especially 100%. when they work. The second thing I do that's super important um, and sometimes hard to remember is to tell stories, not just 
talk about John Stuart Mill. That's important. I'm all for it. Believe me, I do it. But when I'm talking to progressives, as I often do on college campuses, I tell them the story of how I am an American homosexual born in 1960 when it was illegal for me to serve in the military, to work for the government, to have sexual intimate relations in the privacy of my home, when we were reviled by preachers and um, categorized as mentally ill by psychiatrists. And I could go on and on. And today I'm married to a man and it's because of freedom of thought and the ability to criticize and inquire and expose the bad ideas that had been impressing us. So I tell that story as often as I can. Um, storytelling sometimes and personal stories will, will reach people where haranguing them won't. And then a third thing that's valuable yeah. is just, just listening. Before people will open up to an alternative point of view, they want to know that you're willing to hear their point of view and be able to restate it to them. I'm on the, I'm an ally and former board member of a grassroots demobilization campaign called Braver Angels. And one of the yes. things we learned through that is, is the single best question to ask to begin a conversation across a difference that could get hairy is, what is it about your experience in life that led you to your opinion? Right. What is it about your experience in life that led you to that opinion? Because that moves the conversation away from uh, competing factual frameworks to storytelling, and it shows curiosity about the person. And that's where you really begin, I think. So we're going to read, do we want to play this? Uh, uh, oh yeah. This is the, the braver angels. Is that, that's not John, John Woods organization. It is. Yeah. A uh, braver angel. John? Yeah. They changed their name. Yeah. He's a good guy. Just yeah, was it's, texting with him yeah. yesterday. Yeah. He's doing incredibly important work. Um, and he has come to some of, uh, reading my street epistemology events when we were in California. So the, so stories, listening, asking questions. I have something in the, the back of my mind. I was telling you a story before about um, somebody who was attempting to harass and intimidate me rather severely. And my friend pulled up a chair and asked him to sit down. And then he hurled vulgarities at me and then walked away. I And I, I keep thinking about all the the work, the preconditional work that has to go into that. One of the other things you said is you, you talked about the importance of institutions and how we take our institutions for granted. Do you see, and I was just literally, uh, I was in London, I was talking, I had dinner with Greg Lukianoff, who, by the way, Greg Lukianoff told me when he was reading your book, evidently you gave him a, an early copy of your book. Uh, he told me a long time ago, he's like, this is one of the best books I've ever read. So, uh, uh, and then I, I had one of, I thought we were friends. I'm going to have to. Well, <laughs> yeah. yeah and it, because I had read kindly inquisitors and I, I actually did a couple of events uh, uh, for, formed around that. But let me, let me draw your some attention to something else before I ask you about the institution. So we have, we're Reed and I are always experimenting and seeing what works and what doesn't work, and what people like. And so we posted this, what topic do you most want here? Jonathan Peter talk about Second Enlightenment, Cult of Personality, uh, their role at the University of Austin, Effective Polarization, Hate Speech, Street Epistemology, um, Pre-Bunking, Fact Checkers, Free Speech, again, University of Austin, Constitution of Knowledge. Why don't we, hey, Reed, why don't we do, I don't know if you've heard um, uh, Second Enlightenment, but we have a, a video for that. Why don't we, we play that, that video? Oh, and then let's do the street epistemology conversation on one of John's books. So let's let's try let's try that. So Reed and I go around the world and we do street epistemology. And I think we've spoken about that before, if memory serves me correctly. And we have a, uh, a spectrum street epistemology conversation uh, uh, with you that we did in Arizona. Do we have that clip ready, Reed? No offense, society is a no-knowledge society. Two, one, go. A society without hurt is a society that's ignorant. A society that is ignorant is susceptible to propaganda. 
Uh, I love that quotation from your book. Can you explain that to us, please? It's actually copped from uh, Salman Rushdie. Ah, and okay. did not know that. And the uh, yeah, the um, the idea is that if you're the the criticism, even when it's rational criticism, even when it's careful, it is painful to be criticized. And sometimes, even in hard sciences, someone's going to say, you know, this this has happened to you probably, and, and in good faith, not not through canceling. Someone might have said, you know, this paper by Bogosian, this is this is just crap, and here I'm going to yeah. show you why. Uh, and that's in science. In everyday life, we have to put up with all kinds of views that we may find deeply obnoxious. I'm an atheistic homosexual Jew, and I've had my entire life to hear, for example, Christians say things about me and my kind that are, let's just say, um, if if you're a gay kid, they are things that are going to cause some some serious social and personal pain. And yet all new ideas, uh, especially important and good new ideas, are going to offend someone. H.L. Mencken once said that every important new idea is received with as warm a welcome as a new wave of smallpox. Huh. And he's basically right. So the only way we learn is to toughen ourselves, to deliberately actually go out of our way to encounter these new ideas, these offensive ideas, and examine them. And trust that critical examination by ourselves and others will find out what's good in them. Uh, usually there's something good in them, not always, and reject what's bad in them. And that's the only way to get knowledge. A society where you can't do that is an authoritarian society run by some board or commission or star chamber that decides what you can say and think and what you can't say and think. Yeah, Tim Urban in What's Our Problem? I don't know. I don't know if you've read that. It's one of the best books I've read in a long, long time. He talks about this thing about an idea lab where people were basically encapsulated what you just said. So my concern, and I know that I'm not alone in this concern, is that we've created institutions, particularly academic institutions, from K through 12 on up, but particularly in higher ed, that has exactly the opposite of that, where people don't hear the other side of knowledge, where instructors look at the university as an ideology mill. I mean, do you see that? Oh, sure. Um, now, we may disagree on the extent of it. I still think there's a lot of integrity and a lot of free speech in our universities. Um, I also think that there's a serious problem with chilling on university campuses. And I can prove that there are now tons of surveys and they all come out in the same place. 60 to 66% of American college students say that they do not feel free to say what they really think on politics and race and other sensitive matters. Not so much for fear of being harassed or investigated by the university, but for fear of social consequences among their fellow students. This is, as you would expect, an especially big problem for conservative students. Right. But progressive students are also saying that the campus climate is not as open as they would like to multiple points of view. They're saying they would like to hear more from conservative views than they're actually receiving. They are saying, you may disagree. I'd, I'd love your view on this, Peter. They are saying, um, both students I've talked to and the surveys, that most professors, including most progressive professors, are really working to have robust, multi-sided classroom conversations. It's not always true, but it's usually true that professors are trying to get students to grapple with these controversial questions, and the students are going dead. That they won't do it, especially if one of the students says something like, well, you're not a student of color. Right. You can't say that. You have no place having that point of view. That just shuts down the conversation. And so, more and more professors yeah. are telling me that that's a, it's become a real obstacle to instruction at universities. So what do you what do you do about that to have a robust constitution of knowledge or to, to like so what's the way out? Well, I'd love to know your view on that. Uh, you're coming out of that world. Um so there are tons of things you do. It's it's not just one thing. How long of a list would you like? We could I'll go just, on you know, for whatever, an hour, but, but I'll... Yeah. So 
Um, students are coming to university with no idea what the First Amendment says. They think the Constitution bans hate speech because uh, no one's yeah. told them otherwise. So freshman orientation should include a First Amendment free speech module. C schools are doing that now. Purdue's done it. University of South Florida very successfully. They use student skits, for example. It's student-led. Um, so you just tell students what to expect when they get to college. Another thing is they're coming to universities without any experience in structured argument or criticism. They've been sheltered from that. Uh, there's a movement afoot that I'm very supportive of to bring debate to classrooms. It's called debate-centered instruction. It's still embryonic, but it's taking off. And what it does is expose students to how, how exciting and fun it can be to disagree. And it makes them take the opposite side of the argument sometimes from the one that they actually believe. So they get practice in understanding how points of view can vary. Yeah, you that's need... excellent. That's excellent. Reed yeah. and I do that sometimes. We, on the Spectrum Street Epistemology View, sometimes we ask people to, ar to go on the opposite lines and argue that. So I think that's important. Yeah. Uh, we're bringing braver angels debates to high schools and colleges. That's a different form of debate. It's a truth-seeking debate, uh, kind of a public forum. But it's very effective because people can come to that. It creates a structured environment where people can, can speak their mind. Uh, and students turn out they love that once they get acclimated and they know there's a structure that makes it safe to have those conversations. They want to have the hard conversations about capital and drugs and gun controls and, and, and even race. Um, need firm commitments from universities speech. Again, we're seeing more of that. Not enough. You can attest to the not enough part, but we're starting to finally see university administrations and leaders begin to push back against illiberal forces on campus. They're starting to realize they've been manipulated. We've seen that, for instance, at Stanford and at yeah. Yale. You need strong policies that support free speech. You need to say you will not investigate students or faculty for First Amendment protected speech unless it's obviously crossing a line to a non-protected category like plagiarism or, uh, or personal harassment. So you need to know that the administration is going to be solid, and then you need to project those values. And that's something universities have not been doing, again, until recently. You need to, to make part of your statements that your core mission is to freedom of thought and freedom of speech. And it is not welcome on this campus to deplatform someone. And like students Chicago should be principles. disciplined for that. Yeah, Chicago principles. There's a new statement, which is even better. It's the Princeton principles just came out now, Robbie day George, before yeah. yesterday. Yeah. And beyond signing that, you've got to have leadership, the president and the provost and faculty who will uphold those things. I think, you tell me, Peter, but, but yeah. I think things that, that that probably rock bottom was around 2020 and things are beginning to move gradually in a better direction. Um, what do you think though? I think it's, I think it's murky and messy and hard to know. I, I think mm -hmm. that I do think if you take the 30,000 foot view and I could be wrong about this, I don't think I am. Um, and I say I, I could be wrong cause I've, I've been wrong in the past. I always keep thinking we've we've hit peak critical social justice, as Helen Puckrose terms it. I do think something feels different now. Um, when I started my nonprofit, we used to everyone except me took different names because they were worried about harassment for fighting for free speech and open inquiry, for example. And now people use their names. I think that there have been there have been specific. I would go so far as to say cultural incidences, like like um, stories of detransitioners. Like you said, stories. Our minds are wired for stories, not double-blind, peer-reviewed. Uh, I, I think – here's what – I think as long as there are DEI offices, and I just spoke to Chris Rufo about this, and for whatever one's disagreements with Chris is, he's actually trying to do something to solve the problem, even if one doesn't agree. I think you can't I, – I think we need to tame – if not eradicate entirely, which I actually think eradicate entirely, but deal with the DEI bureaucracy, offices in search of tasks, offices in search of, um, to, to create, a, to use your uh, verbiage, a chilling effect on campus. I don't know how you change attitudes when 
okay, let me take a step back. He, he, I, I agree with a lot of what you said, but I think it has to start before that. I think it has to start with colleges of education and teacher training and people are being pumped this nonsense into K through 12 education through pre-service colleges of teacher education. So they get teaching certificates where they've been indoctrinated into things that they're not scientific, they're not falsifiable, and they're conspicuously ideal, ideological. And yet these uh, uh, worldviews are presented as, as epistemically justified. They're presented as a truth, which is kind of weird for people who don't believe in objective truth. But uh, I, I think the problem starts with college of edu college of education and pre-service teacher education programs. But one of the things I'm 57, I'm slightly younger than you. One of the things that I've learned after a lifetime of serious study of belief is that people choose their beliefs for moral reasons. And you have to give people a moral reason to want to value evidence. I just talked to Richard Dawkins and I asked him about that. And I've been thinking about this from an institutional uh, view in terms of the academies and legacy institutions, media, et cetera. And I've been thinking about it in terms of a personal view from, you know, that's when Reed and I do the street epistemology. Uh, we go around the world and do that. But this is a long answer. But the, bo the bottom line is it has to come up. P people will make choices because they want to be a good person. The syllogism, I want to be a good person, good person, hold these beliefs attitudes, et cetera, I hold these beliefs. And I think that has to be taught as young as possible. You know, um, well, I, I agree that should be taught as young as possible. And uh, one reason I'm so interested in Braver Angels High School debates and debate-centered instruction is it's not just teaching these principles, it's practicing them. Um, and it actually, it's, it's way more fun to debate a topic um, that has to do with your schoolwork than to have to stand there and give a presentation. Students love it totally. too. So, so practice is important. Something I'm finding, again, you tell me, yeah. whenever I talk to, to students, college students and high school students, teenagers, about the left-wing woke stuff that in some cases they're being fed, I don't think it's as common as you says it is, but I think it's still pretty common. They're not buying it. They are cynical about it. I think the group that's five or 10 years ahead of them, and certainly some of the more left-wing faculty members are deeply into it. But whenever I talk to a teenager, their attitude is, yeah, 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 we have to say that stuff. It's a box we have to check. And um, there's no point resisting it. The consequences are too great. So we know what we have to say, but do we believe it? No. Yeah. They don't believe well, it. I well, get that a, a lot. So what it's breeding yeah is cynicism. That's bad. Terrible. It's not quite the same as indoctrination. Yeah. You know, that, that reminds me, you, you've said something. I want to segue from that, and that's very hopeful. What is effective polarization? That's when it's not just that you disagree with the other person about some matter of public policy, you know, taxes too high, too low, abortion, yes, no, gun control. It's when you fear and hate the other person. So that's when you answer questions about feeling thermometers, like how cold do you feel to the other side? When you just, you kind of stop caring about them as a human being. You think that they're a threat to the country. Um, you think that they're hostile to you. So it's an emotional polarization. And that's different from mere ideological polarization. Yeah, ideological polarization, in many cases, you can you can bargain over. Abortion is hard, but, you know, taxes, too high, too low, budget, bigger government, smaller government. Those things, you know, if, if you have some confidence that the other side is, is a human being and trying to reach a solution, you can sit down and work with that. And that's what Congress has been doing on a good day for over 200 years. And that's the system that, that James Madison designed for. You know, you don't like the compromise. You may not like the people on the other side, but at the end of the day, you're kind of there to do a deal. Affective polarization, you don't trust the people on the other side. You don't think they'll keep a deal. You think the future of the country depends on your winning the election and eliminating the other side. And that's a much tougher problem because you can't negotiate 
across yeah. that kind of emotional divide. Yeah, in your that clip from Reason, and I've heard you say before, and it's something I've said, I harp on a, a lot, is that one of the things that I find most disturbing, the thing that veers us away from the constitution of knowledge is the, and, and liberal society, is that certain people do not play by the rules of engagement. So I'm a little hesitant to bring this up, but Andy No just had a trial here in Portland. And holy moly, the... Again, I'm a little hesitant to bring it up, but but th there are some so, some people who stick to the rules, and there are some people who intentionally break the rules because they're so convinced in the righteousness of their cause. Uh, so, beginning back to solutions, because I've been trying to think about as I have these conversations with people. Now that everybody understands this is a mass derangement syndrome, what do we do about it? Um, one thing one one opinion i've had is we need a kind of way to cognitively vaccinate people against deranged ideas i i think that street epistemology is probably the best way to do that but i'm not going to make that su such a grandiose claim i'll say it's an excellent way to do that and you mentioned debates that people can do well anybody can do street epistemology they can just you don't even need lines of tape you can just put chalk on the floor and you could do it in your classroom it's a free resource and we provide resources for how to do that in fact reed is the president of street epistemology international and there um he provides a lot of resources that's free it's a nonprofit uh for people who who uh seek to do that um so reed we have a couple of the clips i'd like to play uh jonathan um and let me know what you think of these so let's just go through the list one thing you can't say is that Maybe January 6th, while appalling on one level, maybe it was not an insurrection. So let me, let me talk about, I've, I, haven't, I haven't talked about this much in the campaign. I'll be very honest with you. You want to know what caused January 6th? There's such a temptation to say that there's one man whose name is unspeakable. We well, can't. No, first of all, it's QAnon. It it's QAnon. It's QAnon. <laughs> you want to know what caused January 6th? Is pervasive censorship in this country in the lead up to January 6th? You tell people in this country they cannot speak, that is when they scream. You tell people they cannot scream, that is when they tear things down. And so the reality is, we were told that you could not question where the virus came from when we all knew it came from a lab in Wuhan, which now they admit. We were told that you could not send a private message to someone on the eve of an election that Hunter Biden's laptop story was actually a true story worth considering before an election. You were systematically suppressed. So this is, think about this. You told you had to be locked down, had to take a vaccine that was mandated and forced down your throat, stay locked down in your home while Antifa and BLM roam and burn the streets of this country. So that's the lead up of one full year of telling people you have to shut up, sit down and do as you're told. And then you tell them, okay, there's an election where you didn't get the information that you needed, such as the Hunter Biden laptop story being real and suppressed. That's what caused January 6th, is a cycle of censorship in this country. And until we look ourselves in the mirror and admit truth on that, we will not move forward as a country. Okay, so I just want to say before we comment on that is that I run a small nonprofit and... Yeah, it's against the law to endorse anybody. I'm not endorsing anybody. I'm just looking at his ideas. What what did you what did you think of that clip? A you go specific? first. I want well, to know I, why you played it. Oh, I played it because I was thinking about so I've been listening to Reed and I have been listening to a lot of your podcasts and and been reading a lot of your stuff. And I've been thinking about why it is is it true that when you censor ideas or when you tell people things and full disclosure um i i fell hook line and sinker for the hunter biden laptop story i believed it was a uh, act of, of russian disinformation and i think it's important when you move in the public space if you make a mistake that you admit your mistake publicly, or if you thought something that turned out to be false, that you you tell people, hey, look, I, I fell for this. I believe that I made a mistake. I was wrong. I'm sorry. Uh, and so I think it relates to the idea that when people get frustrated because they can't, they, they feel they have to self-censor or they feel the institutions censor them, then they're going to increasingly act out. 
And do you feel that, I think that was Vivek Ramaswamy. Vivek, yes. Um, do you feel that his characterization of the climate of censorship is correct and that his argument is correct that the real blame for January 6th lies with Twitter? Um, I, I don't think he said Twitter. Did he say Twitter? No, but he said social media censorship. Oh, if you can't okay. Say th and, well, and, that's, he, and the that's, example he yeah. cited was was Twitter, and um, he didn't name them. But that's the only only one place actually stopped the propagation of a laptop story. It was Twitter, and it was only for a period of hours. Facebook did not. Um, none of the mainstream media boycotted it. You had to live in a cave not to know the Hunter Lap, uh, Biden laptop story, and. It was top of the news at the New York Post, which is one of the biggest circulating news organizations in the country. You try getting on the front page of the New York Post. So um, so Twitter is in practice the only example he has of that. And I think he's saying that that's what caused, that's who to blame for January 6th. Do, do you think that, so from that, I from what he said, here's what I pull from it, that when people feel that certain ideas aren't allowed to be expressed or they feel either censored or they have to self-censor it almost by necessity, if not by necessity leads them to act out. So, so here we have to distinguish that clip gets my hackles up because okay. virtually all of it was factually incorrect. Okay. And, and we can go through why it was factually incorrect, but, okay. but I think that people in public life have an obligation to try to be factually correct and increasingly, but especially not only, but especially in conservative land, we're seeing politicians and political figures who feel free to wildly exaggerate and make stuff up. And that's troublesome. We saw that there. A second thing that we saw there that really gets my hackles up is to try to blame somebody other than the people who stormed into the Capitol, defecated there, desecrated there, broke windows, attacked hundreds of police, and tried to overturn an election for the first time in American history. They're trying to blame me and you for that. Mm. And I thought conservatives believed in individual responsibility and the rule of law and people making wise choices. I think that there, even if you think that you're not as free as you should be to voice your opinions, yeah. I don't think that excuses trying a violent coup to overthrow the government of the United States and injure police people, mace them with pepper spray, try to seize their weapons and kill them with flagpoles. So as you can see, I get emotional when I see what I think are valid arguments for free speech, twisted, distorted, and weaponized by far right-wing activists who are trying to evade and change the blame for the bad stuff that far right-wing activists are doing. So set all that aside, does yeah. he have a point that censorship fails for a lot of reasons and that one of those reasons is it tends to spark a backlash? Yeah, he's right about that. I say that all the time to my progressive audiences. If you want to make sure that some marginal jerk gets in the news and becomes famous with his silly, hateful point of view, deplatform and cancel him then his speaking fees will go up and everyone will want to know what he says and he'll become a cause celeb. This is how Hitler, yeah. I'm a Republican, I'm a Republic had very strong laws against Nazi hate speech. So they put Hitler's people, the Sturmer and his other propagandists on trial and they got convictions and those were the best thing possible for the Nazis. They plastered Germany with signs saying things like, what is it? that Herr Hitler says that the authorities don't want you to hear. Uh, so that's one of a lot of reasons censorship is a bad idea. But for heaven's sake, let's not pervert that argument into talking points for, for violence and... 
Okay. So what, one of the things that you, that you talk about that I find so interesting that relates to the, this conversation is you've said uh, I'm bullish on something like Facebook's uh, Facebook's oversight board uh, pre bunking, if you will. I was wondering if you could comment on that, like who fact checks the fact checkers, because it relates directly to the idea of censorship and what people can say and the mediums on which they're allowed to say it, not just Twitter, but the whole social media space or X or whatever Twitter is called now. So fact checkers fact check each other. And if something's wrong, they're called out by lots of people on social media and their code of ethics says that uh, first and foremost, you got to correct your errors when you're wrong and good fact checkers will do that. There is a fact check code of ethics. There is uh, a professional association which actually looks at certified fact checkers if they want a certification. They have to sign up for that code and they're actually assessed on whether they're meeting it. And, you know, you can trust that or not. My experience with fact checkers is, you know, they're journalists like any others. So they're going to have their biases and they're going to make mistakes. But on the whole, they're they're pretty good. Um, I am um, I'm, I'm bullish on Facebook's oversight board. Huh. OK. Um, what what, what, it, what, what is that? As an experiment. So. Yeah. So Facebook said correctly, look, we're going to have to have standards in Facebook for how you behave around here. Uh, Facebook is it's four things. It is a platform. So you want people to speak freely, but it's also a publisher, which means it's making choices about content. And it's a company, which means it needs to make a profit. And it's a community which means it has to provide a space where people, most people will feel comfortable. And three of those th four things actually require it to moderate content because you can't be a publisher, a community, um, or a, uh, what was, what was the, whatever the, the fourth was, unless you're willing to set some standards. So they have standards and they have uh, terms of service. And then the question is how to do that. And that turns out to be a wicked hard problem. Yeah. And Facebook decided, so, we're not equipped to make those decisions and neither is anyone else in particular. Let's do if we can set up a body that will try to develop some norms and standards in a transparent way, make those public, and then begin to create case law where over time you rule on cases when they come up about whether something should be taken down or left up or promoted or demoted. And you begin to create like a common law of where these community standards are going to be. Now, this isn't the government, so this isn't right. censoring anyone. They can go somewhere other than Facebook. Right. But this is an attempt to try to create a sense of transparency, transparency and uniformity. In the large majority of cases where takedowns have come before the oversight board, they have decided that those things should not have been taken down and should be restored. Uh, and then they've gone further and they give reasons for that. And then they create case law for that. And I'm thinking the uh, content moderation online is a wicked hard problem because you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. But this is maybe the most interesting and innovative way to try to deal with it. And it's something that the founders would kind of recognize. You're trying to build an institution to create right. some pathways. And the reason, so Elon Musk has claimed repeatedly that he's a free speech absolutist. The reason with until he bans journalists for saying things he doesn't like, yeah. Uh, who, who are you who are you thinking about? Oh, when they put Substack links in, or what do you what do you? Yeah, they put Substack links in, and he just I think if I'm not mistaken, we can fact check this, but but I think yeah. early on in his tenure, he just started deplatforming uh, outlets. I think NPR was falsely characterized as partisan. And then he, he just took some people down or off who had criticized him. You don't, you, you don't think you think NPR is nonpartisan. Uh, I don't think they should be treated as state owned media, which is, I think how ah, he that's what he state said. media. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they, they take funds from the federal government. Um, so but the broader point here isn't, yeah. it's not about Elon Musk. It's yeah. It's very easy to say you're with the free speech wing of the free speech party. The real test comes when you're criticized. Sure. And that's when the rubber meets 100%, the road. hundred percent. Absolutely. And What's the problem? I don't think Elon Musk passed that test initially. We'll see how he does going forward. He's pulled back on some of that. And that's, that's good. 
And, and the problem with just removing the gu the guardrails and just letting anybody post anything is because I'm I'm specifically thinking, and I have assiduously avoided talking about COVID or vaccinations or anything because nobody should listen to anything I have to say. I'm not a scientist. I have no medical knowledge, so I've avoided it. I I I um, did read Matt Ridley's book on the lab leak hypothesis and that was before there was somewhat of a consensus and i remember uh uh brett weinstein being uh de uh, demonetized and stigmatized etc he went on uh, uh bill maher and said it was a lab leak hype uh, he said it was likely a lab leak i can't remember his exact words and everybody went crazy on him he's a conspiracy theorist he's a goon he's a crazy man he's a lunatic etc and I believe uh, maybe the read or someone can fact check this for us. Uh, um, I believe that he was censored on Facebook and across platforms as well. But, but my, my, my larger point is what's the problem with just taking off the guardrails and letting anybody, I'm not saying I advocate this. I'm just, I'm just sincerely asking just taking off the guardrails and letting anybody post anything they want. Well, then you have to deal with the, the guy who targets the African-American community with don't forget to vote on Wednesday. So no community is going to allow that because it's going to be um, toxic to their community members and they'll stop coming if they're getting toxic misinformation. Uh, so if you're running a business, uh, you can't be toxic. I mean, cigarette companies killed their customers, but yeah. social media doesn't want to do that, which means but, you have to set some guardrails. And then the question becomes, what are they going to be and how do you administer them? And that's that's really, really hard. I think something that we have learned, I think the Hunter Biden laptop story on Twitter was part of that learning experience, including for Twitter, um, is that just knocking stuff all off altogether goes back to your earlier point. It only draws attention to the position you're trying to deplatform. So what you have to do is interstitial warnings where you can tell yeah, people, yeah. look, you know, you can go to this other link for a different point of view, or you can demote things in the feed so that they're not quite right at the top. That's what Google does with stuff like that. Um, but you, you do things that don't involve banning people, but do involve trying to prefer true information over false information. Okay. Let let, I want to push back on something because I've been thinking about this. So let's say that, that to use your example, someone says, okay, you know, voting is don't uh, go out to, I can't remember exactly how you phrase it, but go out to vote Wednesday. If people know that there is mass disinformation occurring, wouldn't that cause them to be either one more skeptical, maybe both. So it's not an either one more skeptical of the information they receive and or two more diligent in seeking out information that is true or, or, yeah i'll leave it there for now so so yes yes and no okay yes if people think that your platform is a pipeline of disinformation and misinformation and unreliable information they'll leave your platform but if you're a social media company that's undesirable um, you don't want them to leave your platform. You want them to think it's a safe place for you and your kids and your family where you'll generally get good information. So from the point of view of the incentives of the companies, this is not a hard call. Um, so the second dimension of, of the point you're making is to what extent are we our own best defenses against misinformation and disinformation? And the answer is, we're kind of okay at that, but not as good as we think. Humans are, excuse me, just rife with cognitive distortions that are surprisingly easy to manipulate. And it turns out that just being smart does not help guard against them. In some Correct. ways, it, it makes it even worse. You've seen this in universities, right? 100%. And it turns out that these manipulations uh, are very sophisticated. And they include things like, for example, creating a false consensus. So this is what woke activists do on college campuses. By actual count, the extreme left, the progressives who dominate these conversations on campus are not a majority. In fact, they're not even that large of a minority. 
they're a fairly small minority, but by using aggressive tactics like deplatforming and calling for investigations and intimidation um, and using social media, they can create the impression, they can silence people or chill people who disagree with them, Correct. thus creating the impression that they're a majority. Correct. And what that does, it turns out, is when people, even if they have the majority opinion, if they believe that they're a small, isolated group, they shut down and chill themselves. So you get what's called a spiral of silence in which Excellent. people- exactly. It, in which majority opinions suppress themselves and small minorities who are unrepresented, unrepresentative, can effectively take over the conversation. Well, where else can you do that? And the answer is social media. A, a small group of anti-vaxxers became very good in the early 2000 teens. This is before COVID. Yeah. At using a combination of influencers, bots, very aggressive direct action in posting, trolling, and so forth. Right. So that when you went on social media and looked up vaccination, the anti-vax opinion looked much more prominent and powerful than it actually was. In many cases, it would be a majority of what you found. And that's attempting to create this snowball effect where people think, well, so many other people believe it, it must be true. Correct. Well, on a place like Twitter, that's easy to do because half the people there aren't even people, right? They're bots. You right. can just, you can set an algorithm to echo uh, and retweet and like stuff at will. You can post stuff that's false at will. You can use algorithms to propagate the memes that transmit the best. Correct. These are memes that by definition are sticky in our brains, right? Even if they're debunked, the debunking itself, it turns out, will in many cases increase, not reduce their purchase That's in the correct. brain because we hear them again and again. Correct. And we're not very good at remembering the arguments against them. We just remember that we keep hearing it. Vaccines will kill you, thimerosal, et cetera. So it is, it turns out, very difficult for individuals by themselves to defend these things. And that's why you set standards, epistemic standards in communities that make it harder to use those manipulations. And that's why, for example, scientific processes, the stuff that we do in universities when we do it right, work very hard when they work. I'm not saying they always do. That's that yeah. other conversation. But when they work, they work very hard to say, you know, Peter Bogosian, you're going to have to subject your views to criticism. It's going to be by credentialed people. They're going to mm -hmm. have to show their work and back it up. They can't make stuff up rule after rule after rule. So you've got to have structure or else uh, this information prevails. Yeah, that that was one, one of the things that we used to see before. I call it cultural 1.0. When if, if someone wrote an article at, at that one's colleagues did not like, they would rebut the article, preferably in the same journal, but not necessarily in the same journal, but they, they would, they played by the same rules of engagement. Yes. You know, they, they wouldn't and they, report. And there were like, rules of engagement. Yeah, that, there were. that's right. They wouldn't report like what they did to Bruce Gilley. They tried to take his PhD and, you know, vote by Twitter. Uh, they, they, they wouldn't report him to the diversity office and subject him to endless indicate, uh, uh, um, harassment campaigns of investigations because they didn't like his piece, the case for colonialism, et cetera. So I just want to, I just want to ask a couple of quick questions. So the, you think one of the best ways for people to value a liberal society is to like what you said before, tell them, like frame things in terms of stories, ask them in terms, ask them what got them, what in their life led them to believe what they currently believe. Listen, do you, do you, is that, is that right so far? Yeah. Yeah. And personal conversation, the institutional yeah. stuff is a separate thing. You know, that's about rules and norms and things like that, but yeah. Okay. And so, Okay, so I'm, it's going to seem like it's unrelated, but one of the things that I've I've been interested in lately is 
I've been talking to a lot of like super smart people who are really well educated. What is the process for you when you come to a belief? Like, how do you change your mind about something? How meaning? Well, like, you know, like, So we we we've we've spoken for, from when when we've been at the University of Austin and and um, you you've always struck me as as um, my conversations with you have reinforced my perception when I've read your books and listened to your podcast and stuff and you've always struck me as um, a very thoughtful guy and somebody who has a lot of integrity. And I'm not saying that to blow hmm. smoke, smoke, smoke. I'm just telling that to, that's factual because it's leading into the question. Thank you. And so I'm, I'm wondering, lot. it's true. You know, a lot of people, I don't really give a hoot what, what they think about me, but there are some people I, I like, there's some, some people like if, if, if you said to me this other day, like, oh shit. Uh, oh, and there we go. I was trying not to swear. I swore, but okay. Um, so like, what is the process for you? Like, when you like the Vivek clip or, or we have a few other clips we didn't, we didn't play. Like when you change your mind about something like about a, a belief you have, and I'm talking about not, you know, should we go to McDonald's or Burger King or something? Oh, I want to go to Burger King. And then your husband uh, we, we met t convinces you to, to go to, to the, to, to another restaurant. Like I'm talking about ideas that have a moral valence. Maybe they're controversial maybe they fall within the suite of other propositions that you believe that maybe they cohere around a, a base belief in kind of an architectonic structure of, of, of moral foundations or moral beliefs. Hmm. How do you question? And, and, and if you feel broadsided by this question, I can answer it for, for what I do. If, if, but how, how, what does that process look like for when you start to question your belief? So, boy, that's such a profound question. I'd love to hear your answer to it. I don't know that there's any one place that that this process starts. And, and you know, Peter, sometimes you're not even aware that your mind is changing. It kind of percolates back there until you realize that you come to a different place or that you're asking questions. Um, it helps that I'm in a very empirical environment. I'm at the Brookings Institution, which is old fashioned in the sense that we're, we're, very, we're very empirically oriented. And we think it's your duty if, if uh, as Keynes is supposed to have said, when the facts change, sir, I change my mind, what do you do? So that environment helps. It helps that I try to expose myself to views that I know I'll, I will find disagreeable. That's, that's hard to do, but... Um, but I do my best. I try to triangulate and read things, for example, outlets that are on other sides of questions. In a lot of cases, what it is for me is just looking at the world and seeing surprises and things that didn't go as I expected. Um, and an example of that, it doesn't have a high moral valence, but it's an example of mind changing is that I was for quite a while, a skeptic on, on what's called ranked choice voting. Yes. And there's a whole bunch of, it's a whole separate conversation about that. And in the past year or so, I have, I've come around. I still don't think I, that it's going to solve all our problems. I think it's way overrated, but it's been used in some elections it seems yes. to work pretty well. Voters seem to understand it. Um, and I've come to understand, I think, better the theories behind it than I did originally. And that came from talking to um, Catherine Gale, for example, and some oh, yeah. of the people who are sophisticated, who are supporting it. And so it's kind of that kind of process. So um, l let me ask you a question then. So your most of the things, but not everything, like the environment, we bracket that. Most of what you said, it boils down to a disposition. Like you have an attitudinal disposition. 
I don't know. I feel like I also have an obligation. I wonder if the feeling of obligation is in itself an attitudinal disposition. I I guess it is, but I I feel it's, it's why the constitution of knowledge is so important. It's just, it's not just rules on paper. You spent the first, I don't know, 30 years of your life probably, or at least through graduate school, getting inculcated into a set of rules and norms about how to conduct research, how to do science in a way that has integrity, how to engage with people who disagree with you in a way that is not ad hominem, um, how to respond without deplatforming. All these things are very complicated. How to do peer review, how to muster evidence. It takes years and years to learn this stuff. And it's all part of the constitution of knowledge, which is right. an agreed upon set of rules that we're going to use in a collective search for truth. And they're really hard rules. Correct. They require a lot of a lot of professionalism and detachment and not doing things you're inclined to do. And the key to the constitution of knowledge is like the US constitution. It won't do if it's just rules on paper. We have to be raised from childhood to think it's it's really important to follow rules that will keep us honest in conversation yeah. with each other and to believe we have a moral duty to the constitution ah. of knowledge as we do to the U S constitution. Right. That's Constitutions the values thing. only work. Yeah. They right. only work when they become part of our moral makeup so that, so that we feel that as you do, that a wrong has been committed when someone who claims to be a social scientist distorts some evidence or tries to deplatform someone who is making a valid argument. It's not just that you think they shouldn't do that, it's against the rules. You feel outraged by that, and you should. Yeah, it's interesting. I've been thinking for a long time about the word outrage and whether that's a whether that's ever a legitimate state or or something to feel as opposed to something else. I I don't know. Maybe it's just my disposition. Um, oh, we got to do. Uh, we, we we're almost at our at our at our hour. But I I don't know. I never feel outraged about anything. Like I I have other emotional or emotions or states that supplant that, or not even supplant. Just all right. But let's do. Uh, we're we're three minutes, and I don't want to keep you over the hour. Uh, let's do our our super chat read. Hey, Jocko Splink. Uh, non-progressive male teachers, fifth to eighth grade. How? Ah, oh, that I. That's. Uh, okay. Well, uh, I'll take a. I'll take a stab at that. Uh, one of them is you uh, have new colleges of education, like I think the University of Austin is going to do. Uh, you offer alternative modalities for curriculum that 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 aren't based upon Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Maybe they're based upon Locke or Mill or. Um, you self-select from the people from so instead of looking at you know, diversity statements as a as a as a tool to weed out there i read an article the other day like many diversity statements are being written by chat gpt which i thought was interesting probably incoming essays too i don't really know um but i think that there are there are correctives that we can build into the system uh did you have any takes on that you good Oh, John, are you yeah, there? No, Did I lose no, yeah, no, oh, I, nothing to add to that. Okay, cool, cool. Um, all right, anything else you wanna you 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 wanna say? Any anything else? Did I did I forget to ask you uh, anything, or should I have asked you other stuff? Well, I can give you link in the show notes to uh, why I think you're wrong about uh, okay. the origin of coronavirus. Why I think the media sure. handled that exactly well. And by the way, please, it's please. still not proven to be lab leak. The predominant theory is still that it was in a wet market. Okay. Uh, so if that would interest people, that's an alternative yep. point of we, view. I, if, you, I, if you put that in there, we we will post it. I am not, uh, in, I'm, I am like you. I think that's the one thing that we have in common, even though we have disagreements. We're both deeply committed and profoundly concerned about what's true. So 100%, I'll absolutely put that, that in there. And anything else that you want to, about the Biden laptop, anything you want to put in there, uh, we will put and people can can look at that and uh, alternative um, um, or just just different different ways of thinking about things. So I appreciate that. And where can cool, people? I mean, I'll send you a couple of things. Cool, cool. Yeah. Uh, where where can people? Oh, and be don't hang up the chat yet because it's got a process. Where can people find you? 
I have a, a website that I put um, my more important articles on. I, I write a lot of stuff, but but I put stuff that I think might stand the test of time up there. It's just jonathanrausch.com. I was on Twitter pretty often, but I've kind of lost interest in it mm. now that it's become what it's become. So I'm not really very much on social media. Um, and you can Google me and, and find lots of lots of stuff that I write. Uh, I'd encourage anyone who's interested in today's topic to get a look at the constitution of knowledge, which is an attempt to set out in a comprehensive way where knowledge comes from in a in a free and knowledgeable uh, and peaceful society. Free, knowledgeable, and peaceful. Awesome. And those are great words to end on. Hey, John, thanks for talking to me. I really appreciate it. And I, I hope to see you again when we go to uh, Austin. I will see you there. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody, for watching. We appreciate it. We kept it at an hour, so we're going good. John, just hang out for a minute, and uh, Reed will take it from here.